All right, well, welcome back, everyone. Thank you for joining me. I know that we're approaching a long weekend here, so uh, I appreciate you giving me some time just before the fourth here. If you would like to go through the problem uh, on your own as we're uh, working through it today, you can find this handout in the videos section for week seven, both in the pre-recorded videos and the live videos section. This will be starter sheet 24 as a PDF on my courses. So happy 4th of July, everybody, even though we're a little bit early, only the second here, but um, obviously we're having this class today because RIT is observing the 4th tomorrow. I hope everybody has a great weekend and that you're uh, able to stay safe but still have some fun. As we noted last class, we will be having the second midterm exam for Thermo next Thursday on the 9th. So we will run at the same time that we ran last time from three to seven. I will run a Zoom meeting from about 5.15 to seven o'clock in case people have questions. The format of the exam will be the same as it was last time. 10 multiple choice problems through a quiz on my courses and two long answer problems that you'll upload to the Dropbox. So I think everything will be the same. And again, we will, uh, we will certainly honor any approved accommodations from the university. So we're coming up to having this second midterm. And as we do, so now we're working on cycles. And basically from here to the end of the class, we will be working on cycles straight through. So we'll go through a, a whole lot of different cycles, actually. Um, our last class will be Wednesday, August the 12th. I think we'll probably run the exam on Friday, August the 14th. That's the day that the university wants all the final exams uh, in. So they want me to have all the grades in. So I will work really hard to get the grades done that day. Um, and hopefully we don't get in, I don't get in trouble for having the grades in late. Because we started a week late, we'll be kind of rushed to get those things in. But I think it should be okay because we're not an extremely large class here. Does anybody have any questions about the logistics of the second exam? That sounds good. So it will cover from the last midterm, right? So basically everything from conservation of mass up until basically this class, which is an example of a Rankin cycle. So on Monday, we'll have a review where people can just ask me whatever they like and we can work through um, all of your questions. So we've been talking about heat engines and Rankin cycles in particular. So to have a Rankin cycle, you need at least these four components, a turbine, a condenser, a pump, and a boiler. Now, the purpose of the Rankin cycle, right, it's a heat engine. So we're trying to develop power. And in a Rankin cycle, we do that in the turbine. So we take some high temperature steam and it expands through the turbine to give us work. Now the rest of this cycle, the condenser, the pump, and the boiler, it's really only there to get us back to the inlet of the turbine so we can run the mass through the turbine again and generate more power. So what we do, right, is we take this now low pressure steam or maybe high quality low pressure fluid that comes out of our turbine and we condense it. And the reason that we do that is because once it's liquid, it doesn't take us much power to increase the pressure back up to the pressure that we want going into the turbine. But now it's liquid here, right? So we want to get back to a vapor, so now we have to add heat, right? So this is done typically by burning coal or maybe by performing a nuclear reaction, something that gives us heat. And we use that heat to boil water so that now we have high pressure steam that wants to expand through the turbine. And that's what our Rankine cycle looks like, at least the basic Rankine cycle. You need at least these four components to have a Rankine cycle. If we were drawing a TS diagram of this four component Rankine cycle, we have a low pressure, right? So remember a constant pressure line on a TS diagram looks the same as a constant pressure line on a TV diagram where it slopes up and to the right in the subcooled liquid region. It's flat under the vapor dome and then it slopes up and to the right again once we get into the superheated vapor region. We have the low pressure line that's vertically below the high pressure line.
So what we're doing is we're moving between the low pressure and the high pressure. We increase the pressure through the pump and we reduce the pressure through the turbine. And then we assume that the heat transfer processes, either condensing to cool down that steam into water or boiling to boil that water back into steam happen at constant pressure. So we assume that there's no pressure losses through those processes. We generate power in our turbine. We reject heat in the condenser. We add power at the pump and we add heat at the boiler. If we want to characterize this cycle, we need to know the energy benefit and the energy cost of the cycle. So this is our thermal efficiency. In this case, because it's a heat engine, the energy benefit is the net power. That's going to be the turbine power plus the pump power, which is negative, divided by the energy cost, which is the heat in. If the mass flow rates are the same, we can take this as W dot net over Q dot net, where both of those are intensive versions of power and heat transfer in. We can compare this to an ideal or Carnot efficiency, which we can get as 1 minus temperature of our cold reservoir divided by temperature of our hot reservoir. Here, in this equation, we have to use absolute temperatures. Anytime we have an equation where we have a temperature that's not a change in temperature, so not a delta T, we need to use Kelvin or Rankine. Another way we can characterize a heat engine like a Rankine cycle is by using the back work ratio. Now what the back work ratio does is it reminds us that the first customer of the power plant is the power plant. So some of this power that's developed in the turbine has to be used to run our pump, right? We plug that pump into the wall and it gets power from the power plant. So the nice thing about Rankine cycles is that it doesn't take much power to increase the pressure of a liquid. So our back work ratios for Rankine cycles are typically fairly low. How do we find expressions for things like thermal efficiency or back work ratios? You guessed it. We use the first law because anytime you feel like you don't know what to do in thermodynamics, guessing that maybe you should use the first law is a good way to go. Right? So for this open version of the first law, so we assume that all of these processes are open, there's mass flowing through each one of these components, we'll typically assume that everything here is at steady state, that there's one inlet and one outlet, that there's no change in kinetic energy and no change in potential energy, that the processes are either adiabatic or passive. So if we're talking about the pump or the turbine, we're only interested in the power, so we will often say that there are no heat losses from those components, unless maybe the problem tells us that there's heat loss from those components. Or if we're trying to transfer heat, we'll typically say that there's no power in that process. So we typically will cross one of these things out and we'll say between these different components that there's no frictional losses and no heat losses. And the reason that we do that is that so we don't have to keep fixing a whole bunch more states. So we just assume that the pressure and temperature coming out of, say, my turbine are equal to the state that's going into my condenser. So I basically don't have to fix a separate state at the turbine outlet and at the condenser inlet. Even though in real life, you would have pressure loss in the lines and you would have heat loss in the lines. So if we can make all these assumptions in the sort of most basic case, we would find that the turbine power and the pump power are both going to be the mass flow rate through those components multiplied by H in minus H out. We know that the turbine is producing power, so that, that should be a positive number, and the pump is consuming power, so that should be a negative number. We know that the condenser and the boiler are heat transfer processes, so they should give us m dot times h out minus h, excuse me, minus h in. So we assume that the boiler, which is adding heat, gives us positive heat, whereas the condenser, where we're rejecting heat, we get a negative value for q dot. Once we get to these equations, then we have to ask ourselves, what's the fluid? How do we go about finding h or delta h in each one of these equations? Now, for some of these, this is pretty straightforward, things that we're used to, 
looking things up in tables. But for things like pumps, particularly if they're isentropic pumps, there's special ways for us to find these differences. So for the pump, we might use an isentropic pump equation, which tells us that the specific volume multiplied by the change in pressure is a good approximation for delta H across an isentropic pump. And then maybe we'd have to use something like an isentropic efficiency to find the change in enthalpy across the real pump. So what's isentropic efficiency? Remember, we talked about this before. For turbines and pumps, this is a way to compare the power to the power of the ideal system. So for a turbine, which is producing power, that's a benefit. So the irreversibilities in this particular component act to reduce that benefit. So that means that the ideal turbine is going to produce more power than the real turbine. We need our efficiency to be less than 100%. So here we have the real turbine power divided by the ideal turbine power. If we're talking about pumps, the opposite is true. So for a pump, the power is a cost. And the irreversibilities in the system mean that we have to pay a higher cost than we would in the ideal case. So for our isentropic efficiency for pumps, we get the power of the ideal pump divided by the power of the real pump, which again gives us an efficiency less than 100%. So even though kind of the concept between both of these two equations is the same, the actual equation is different. So we have to remember which way these fractions go, or we can look on our equation sheet and see which way these fractions are written down. Today, we're going to talk about vapor power cycles or Rankine cycles, and we're going to do an example problem. So you get some feel of how you solve Rankine cycles. Right? So this is certainly a long answer type problem you might see on the exam. So this is what a picture or a sketch of a four component Rankine cycle might look like. We have a turbine, a condenser, where on the hot side we're cooling down this working fluid that comes out of the turbine, but on the cold side we're pulling in cooling water, maybe from a cooling tower, maybe from Lake Ontario. Somehow we're running cooling water through here that's accepting this reject heat from this uh, condensation process. Then we have a pump where we're increasing our pressure, a boiler where we're adding heat, maybe from a nuclear reaction, and that gets a steam which again runs into our turbine. In this problem, we're given this state table. So it's um, partially completed. So I can see I know everything already about state 1. State 2S and state 2, I only know the temperature. But remember, 2S means it's an isentropic process, right? So that's the exit of this ideal or isentropic turbine. For state 4S and state 4, I only know the pressure. But again, 4S tells me that it's isentropic. And then for states 5 and 6, that's the cooling water. I'm told the pressure is about atmospheric pressure. And the temperature runs from 4 degrees at the inlet. And the water is heated up to 25 degrees at the outlet. I'm also told that the isentropic efficiencies of the turbine and the pump are 0.85 or 85%. So this problem, which is certainly something you could see on an exam, will ask us to draw a TS diagram, find the thermal efficiency, find the mass flow rate of the cooling water between states 5 and 6, find the back work ratio, and track any assumptions that we make along the way. So I can, draw, I can draw boxes around my state table here, or I can segment it into two different parts. So there's the red part. That's what's going on in the heart of my Rankine cycle. right? This is my four-component Rankine cycle that we're kind of learning about now. And then in the blue circle, or outlined in blue here, that's the cooling water. So there's two different parts of this problem. If I draw a TS diagram, it will be the same TS diagram that I showed before. So first, because it's a Rankine cycle, there's phase change. Anytime there's phase change, I need to draw a vapor dome. So if you're asked to draw a TS diagram for a Rankine cycle, draw a vapor dome. You're going to have a low pressure state and a high pressure state, or two low pressure states and two high pressure states. You're going to know something about the turbine. I'm going to assume here, because I think I was given a temperature and pressure, 
I'm going to assume that this is superheated vapor that goes into the turbine. So I'm going to put state one up here. Then if I draw a line vertically down, that's going to be the exit, state 2S, the isentropic exit. Now on my picture here, this looks like it should be two phase, but I just arbitrarily put where state one is. It could be over here. I don't exactly know. So even though my diagram kind of hints at something, I don't know for sure. I drew the outlet at state two right here at this saturated vapor line, but I don't exactly know where that is, but I know it's got to go down and to the right. The exit of my condenser, I think I'm told here that this is a uh, quality of zero or that I have a saturated liquid here. So then if I draw a vertical line up, that's 4S, and then somewhere up and to the right at that same higher pressure is going to be state four. Then the boiler, here I go from state four, I'm adding heat all the way up to state one. Now you don't have to, when you draw these TS diagrams, you don't have to draw where the power in the heat goes but that's something I like to do just to remind myself which process is going to uh, generate or consume power and which process is adding or rejecting heat. The next part of the problem asks us to derive an expression for thermal efficiency. Or maybe it just asks us to find the thermal efficiency, but the first part of that is deriving a symbolic solution. So I know that thermal efficiency is going to be the energy benefit, which is net power, divided by the energy cost, which is heat transfer rate in, right? Or we have to burn some coal or run a nuclear reaction. I know that the net power is gonna be my turbine power plus my pump power. And I remember if I get these expressions from the first law, that pump power is gonna be negative. And I'll divide that by the heat that goes in at the boiler. I gotta remember here that if I'm using the denominator here, the cost is only the heat that goes in at the boiler. It's not the net heat. If this was net heat, I know net heat is equal to net work, and then it looks like my thermal efficiency is always 100%, no matter what I do. So that's not super valuable. So really we're asking here how much of the heat that we put in gets turned into work. When I look at this expression, I don't know the thermal efficiency, I don't know the turbine power, I don't know the pump power, and I don't know the heat that goes in at the boiler. So it's great that I've got this expression, but it doesn't really help me all that much yet. So I got to keep going. So I want to do the first law on the turbine, the pump, and the boiler so I can get better expressions for these terms that are in my thermal efficiency equation. So I'm going to do the first law on all of these components. I'm going to assume that they're all at steady state, that they all have only one inlet and one outlet, that they all have negligible changes in kinetic and potential energy, that the turbine and the pump are adiabatic, so I'll cancel out that Q-dot term, and that the boiler is passive, so in that equation I'll cancel out the W-dot term. I'll also assume that there are no friction or heat losses in between the different components, so that the outlet of the turbine is the same as the inlet to the condenser, and that's true between all of my different components. So when I do this, I'll find that my turbine power is m dot through the turbine times h1 minus h2 that's h in minus h out pump is also m dot times h in minus h out but here this is h3 minus h4 the boiler because i'm finding q dot is going to be m dot times h out minus h in now i'm expecting sorry about that i'm expecting this turbine power to be positive because work out is positive the pump is work in so this should be negative and this is heat in, and heat in should be positive. So I'm expecting these different equations to have different signs. But I can put them all into my thermal efficiency equation. And when I do that, I find that I get this equation, right? Basically, I'm just subbing in the terms that I had before, right? So now this is looking good because I'm getting thermal efficiency as a function of enthalpy. So if I could fix the states, then I could figure out what my thermal efficiency is. But I've still got all these m dot terms. Right? Now, because I've assumed that the whole cycle is happening at steady state and that there's only one inlet and one outlet for all of these components and they're chained together in series, this means that for each component, the inlet mass flow rate is the same as the outlet mass flow rate. And since the outlet mass flow rate of every component is the inlet mass flow rate of the next component, 
these mass flow rates are all the same through every component, right? So I can cancel out, I can get rid of the subscripts on all of these terms, and I can cancel them out, and I get a thermal efficiency that's only a function of my enthalpies. So if I could fix states one through four, then I would be able to find the thermal efficiency. I've already given been given H1, but I don't know H2. H3 is given, I don't know H4. I still know H1 and I don't know H4. So basically, if I could find H2 and H4, I'd be home free for the thermal efficiency. So I can look at my state table and start to think about how I would go about fixing these states. I have a choice here. I can start to fix these states and then answer part B, or I could keep going and just get thermal, or, and I can get symbolic solutions for each one of these uh, parts. Now, when you're doing an exam, you kind of got to make a decision like this, right? So my general philosophy is that you can get a bunch of the points for not that much time if you get the symbolic part of each one of these part of, of each one of these parts of the problem. So if you feel a little crunched for time, I would say instead of marching through and doing everything, maybe think about getting symbolic solutions for each one of these parts first. But it's okay. If you feel like you've got enough time, then uh, you know it's certainly okay to go through and start fixing states. So again, we look at our state table, and part of this is inside the Rankine cycle. That's in red, and part of it is the cooling water, and that's circled in blue here. So I know as I go from state 1 to state 2S, it looks like at state 2S I only know one piece of information. Because on the state table, it only told me that the temperature here was 95 degrees. But in reality, because it's 2S, that means it's the isentropic outlet, which means that the specific entropy at that outlet of the turbine, in this case at 2S, is got to be the same as the specific entropy at the inlet, right? So I can drop this number, 6.9-ish, down onto my state table here for state 2S. And now I have two independent intensive properties in the temperature and the specific entropy. So what I would do is I would go and look at this table and see is 6.89 in between SF and SG for 95 degrees. So I'm pretty confident that this has to be either a superheated vapor or a two-phase mixture. And in this case, I think this was below SG, so I'd have some kind of quality here. So I have to use this information to interpolate for quality. And when I do that, I would get the specific enthalpy at state 2S. So how do I move from state 2S to state 2? So from 1 to 2S tells me what the ideal turbine would look like. Right? That's the maximum amount of power I could get out of a turbine between those two pressures with that mass flow rate. So I can look at my isentropic efficiency equation for a turbine, which is the real power over the ideal power. I recognize that the real state or the real turbine goes between state one and state two, but the ideal or isentropic turbine goes between state one and state two S. I also recognize that it only really makes sense to compare the power between real and ideal turbines if they have the same amount of mass going through them. So I can just cancel out the mass flow rates there. So now I'm told the isentropic efficiency. I was given H1, and now I found H2S by interpolating. So the only thing I don't know here is H2. So I can rearrange this equation to get an expression for H2, and I find that that enthalpy at the real exit of my turbine is 2,600 28.2 kilojoules per kilogram. This is bigger than H2S, which makes sense, right? Because I know that H1 minus H2 has to be a smaller number than H1 minus H2S. So here I'm expecting H2 to be bigger than H2S so that I get a smaller delta. Now we want to find state 4, 
we'd like to find the specific enthalpy at state 4, but before we do that, we need to find the specific enthalpy at the isentropic outlet of the pump. So now that we find the delta H, H4S minus H3. So this is, we're trying to find delta H across an ideal pump. So this, when you're doing Rankine cycles, this is one of the tricky things, right? So we can't just look this up in a table. Because if we did, we would probably approximate H4S to be equal to H3, and we'd find that the power consumed by the pump was zero. And even an ideal pump still has a plug on it, right? So we need to have some power that's consumed by a pump. We get that power by the expression specific volume multiplied by the change in pressure. We saw last class that this comes from basically using the definition of H which is U plus PV, assuming that delta U is zero, and then we just get the delta of VP. But we assume that the specific volumes are about the same, so we can take the specific volume at either state and multiply that by the change in pressure. So what this tells us is that the change in specific enthalpy across this isentropic pump is really driven by the change in pressure, or the increase in pressure that we see across this ideal pump. So here, I got to be careful of the units, right? Because I know my mass flow rate, but my pressure is given to me in bar. And if I have bar meters cubed per kilogram, that doesn't really help me very much, right? So whenever I have pressures, if on the state table, it tells me things in pressures, I want to put it on my state table in terms of kilopascals. I'll get that out of your way. Sorry about that. So if I turn these into kilopascals, then I can get better answers because if I take meters cubed per kilogram and multiply that by kilopascals, then what I'll get is kilonewton meters per kilogram, which is kilojoules per kilogram. And that's the same unit for H that I'd get if I was looking it up in a table. So here I have to remember that to go from a bar to a kilopascal, that one bar is equal to 100 kilopascals. So I have to multiply that number by 100. When I do that, I track my units so the bars cancel out. And now I see that I have 7.9 meters cubed times kilonewtons divided by kilograms per meter squared. If I simplify this out, right, if I take this meters cubed and divide by meters squared, I'm left with meters. Kilonewton meters is kilojoules per kilogram on the bottom. So this is 7.9 kilojoules per kilogram. And this is why I always want to have pressure in kilopascals when I'm dealing particularly with Rankine cycles, but almost always when it's metric, right? So if I get a pressure that's not in kilopascals, if it's megapascals or if it's in bar, it's kind of like my spidey sense starts tingling and I want to, you know, like I have this compulsion to sort of turn that pressure into kilopascals. So now if I know delta H across the isentropic pump, then maybe I can find delta H across the real pump. But to do that, I need to remember my equation for isentropic efficiency of a pump. So this is going to be the ideal power divided by the real power. This is the reciprocal of the equation that I get for turbines. And that's because the power for a pump is a cost, whereas the power from a turbine is a benefit. Here, I'm still going to define these things as m dot times h in minus h out. This is going to be negative for both of these terms, but that's okay. A negative divided by a negative is a positive, right? The mass flow rate through the ideal in the real pumps is also the same, just like the turbines. So now I get that H3 minus H4S divided by H3 minus H4 is equal to the isentropic efficiency of this should be the pump. So what happens here is that we were given the isentropic efficiency of the pump. So we know that. I know H3 and I know H4S, or at least I could find it because really I have H3 minus H4S. So the only thing I don't have here is H4. So I can isolate for H4 and find that it's 407.3 kilojoules per kilogram. This is bigger than H4S, which again makes sense. So now if I'm trying to find the thermal efficiency, I get that it's H1 minus H2 plus H3 minus H4, right? Because this is sort of the, 
turbine power per mass flowing through the turbine, the pump power per mass flowing through the pump, and the heat transfer rate per mass flowing through the boiler, right? But all those mass flow rates are the same, so they all drop out. And here, I get H1 minus H2 plus H3 minus H4 divided by H1 minus H4. And I have all of these pieces of information, or at least I could get them because I know delta H across the pump. Sorry, and here that I, I found that my thermal efficiency was 28.4. So, you know, maybe this looks low, but, you know, remember the thermal efficiency doesn't really cap out at 100%. The maximum thermal efficiency is the Carnot efficiency, which is probably something less than 100%. The next part of this problem asks us to find the mass flow rate of the cooling water. So here, we're cooling down this hot flow that's coming from the turbine and coming out as liquid, but that heat's got to go somewhere. So it goes in to this cooling water that's running over here, right? And I know the temperature difference across that cooling water. So in order to find mass flow rates, I'm going to suggest to you that it's usually a good idea to do conservation of energy or the first law around an entire heat exchanger. Because when we do this, we'll cross out both Q dot and W dot, and we'll have a lot of different M dot terms in there so we can find mass flow rates or ratios of mass flow rates. So when you're looking for a mass flow rate, it's usually a good idea to look at a heat exchanger where we know everything on both sides of the heat exchanger. So we'll draw our control volume around the entire condenser. Now, the first law analysis that we'll do across this condenser, we'll assume that it's at steady state, that there's no change in kinetic energy, no change in potential energy, that it's adiabatic and passive, so I'll cancel out Q dot and W dot, and that there's no friction losses or heat losses across this particular component. So what I mean by no heat losses here, or that it's adiabatic, is that it means that we can transfer heat from the hot stream to the cold stream in our heat exchanger, but we don't lose any heat to the outside world. So when I do this, I get that zero is equal to the sum of m dot in h in minus the sum of m dot out h out. Typically, when I do this, instead of grouping them by inlets and outlets, I will group them by the mass flow rate. So there's this cooling water, Right, So we have m dot of the cooling water times h in minus h out. So this is the cold side of my condenser. And then the hot side of my condenser goes m dot of the hot side minus h2 minus h3. So here we have in minus out on the hot side and in minus out on the cold side. But what I want to find is the mass flow rate of the cooling water. So I'm going to move one of these terms to the other side, right? So I have to multiply one of these things by negative one as I move it to the other side of my equal sign. What this tells me, right, is kind of what I said from the assumptions, right? This says that the heat transfer that goes into the cooling water has the same magnitude, but the opposite sign of the heat transfer that's coming out of the hot side of my uh, condenser, which is cooling down that fluid that's coming out of the turbine, right? So that makes sense because I said that none of that heat that's coming out of that hot side of the heat exchanger can go into the atmosphere. So what this tells me is that all of that heat goes into the cold side. So we would have gotten the same thing if we did the first law on both the hot side and the cold side separately. So except it would have been a little bit hard maybe for us, we'd have to use some uh, engineering intuition to get to the fact that these were equal but opposite. But I could find the Q dot on the cold side and Q dot on the hot side. And then I would just have to make the magnitudes equal but the signs opposite. But I think it's a little easier if I just draw the control volume around the whole thing and then I can't mess up the signs. So here I want to isolate for the cool side mass flow rate. And I get that that's negative times the mass flow rate on the hot side multiplied by this ratio of delta H's. So H2 minus H3 divided by H5 minus H6. And again, if I do this from the first law, 
drawing the control volume around the whole system, I don't have to worry about the signs. I don't have to use any kind of engineering intuition. I just use the first law and let the first law take care of what the signs should be. In this case, I know that delta H across the condenser, or H2 minus H3, is positive. And I know that across the cooling water, H5 minus H6 is negative because T6 is bigger than T5. So I'm a little bit worried because I, I, you know, I could have been a little bit worried here because I know that my mass flow rate should be positive. If I get a negative mass flow rate, essentially what that would be telling me is that the mass is flowing in the opposite direction than what I think it should be flowing. So anytime I see a negative uh, sign out in front of my equation, there's you know a little bit of a, you know apprehension, right? I got this uh, feeling in the pit of my stomach here that maybe I got the sign wrong. But if I think about these delta H's before I put them in, then I see that one is positive and one is negative. So I can just multiply this thing by negative one if I flip H6 and H5. So I think I should be okay here. When I put everything into my calculator, maybe you don't even have to think about this. Again, if you just trust the first law, the sign should work out. You put this into your calculator and you see that the mass flow rate is almost 200 kilograms per second. So, you know, the reason that this happens, right, is that there are environmental regulations that say, right, so let's say we're pulling this water out of Lake Ontario at four degrees, so it's deep enough that we can pull it out at four degrees. I can't just put water back at any temperature into the lake. So there's some uh, environmental regulations about the temperature of the water that I put back into the lake. So, you know, in order to get that temperature difference, what I have to do is drive a lot of mass through the system. So the mass flow rate of this cooling water is very large. The next part of my problem asks me to find the back work ratio. Remember, the back work ratio is kind of a nod to the fact that the power plant is the first consumer of the power plant. So in order to run this thing as a cycle, I need to be able to power the pump from the turbine power. So what percentage of my turbine power goes into my pump? So my back work ratio, I recognize the signs for the turbine and the pump power are going to be different. So here I can take the absolute value, either of each term or just at the end. And I take the pump power divided by the turbine power. In this case, I already have expressions for these things. I know that the pump and the turbine have the same amount of mass flow that go through them. So I can say that my back work ratio is going to be H4 minus H3 divided by H1 minus H2. In this case, my back work ratio was right around 1%. And again, this is the reason that we kind of like Rankine cycles. Is that even though the thermal efficiency of this case was, what was it, something like 25%, something like that, I think, that um, the back work ratio we got was about 1%. So all of the power, almost, that we're generating in the turbine goes out to the grid. right? So we didn't have to consume a lot of power just to get back to the inlet of the turbine. So if I'm trying to collect everything here on my state table, on the hot side and the cold side, I can fill in my enthalpies. So here I have all the enthalpies from state one to state four, including the isentropic outlets of the turbine and the pump. And then I never actually know the specific enthalpies at state five and state six, but that's okay because the first law really only asked me what delta H was. So because it was subcooled liquid in and subcooled liquid out, right? So here we know that at one atmosphere, water boils at 100 degrees and we're far less than 100 degrees here. So I know it's subcooled liquid in and subcooled liquid out. So I could use CP times delta T. So I find delta H, but I don't know what the individual specific enthalpies are. But that's okay because I know the delta H. And that's what the first law asked me for. So in this case, I find that the thermal efficiency was 28.4% that the mass flow rate of the cooling water was almost 200 kilograms per second. Remember, we said that was high. Here, we only have about 8 kilograms per second going through the Rankine cycle. So we have much, much more mass flow rate going through the cooling side because we want to keep that delta T at 21 degrees in this case. We also found that the back work ratio was 1%. So again, when we look at these Rankine cycles, 
we might get discouraged a little bit that our thermal efficiency in this case is relatively low, right? So what this tells us is that not even 30% of the heat we put in gets turned into power. So we're going to examine after the first midterm or after the second midterm, we're going to examine tricks that we can use to improve the thermal efficiency of different Rankine cycles. But for now, we know how to make this basic Rankine cycle with four components. What we do is we look at each individual component. We do a first law analysis. We use the powers and the heat in in order to find our thermal efficiency. We can find the back work ratio using the pump and the turbine powers. We can even look across condensers, right, to find things like the mass flow rate of the cooling water. So hopefully this gives you an idea of the strategies that we can use. In this problem too, we you can see that, you'll probably see this on an exam, where you'll get a state table that's partially filled, but not totally filled. So you'll have to do some things to find out how to go from state to state to fix the next state, right? So start at places where you know everything or where you know the most, like in this case, state one and state three, and then use things like, you know, it looks like here that we only know one thing about this state, but really we ended up knowing two things because we know that for an isentropic process, delta S is zero. So here we knew that delta S here was zero. We knew that delta S was zero across the ideal pump too, but we didn't use the specific entropy to find the enthalpy at the exit of the ideal pump. Instead, we used that special equation that we have for isentropic pumps. So hopefully this gives you uh, an idea of how to go about solving these Rankine cycles. That's going to be the end of the lecture for today. On Monday, like I said, we're going to have uh, an exam or a lecture that's um, kind of a review lecture. I'll have my lecture slides prepared, but what I'd prefer to do, what I think might be more valuable for you, is if I go through just any questions that you have and we can kind of think about things and uh, and look at individual questions that you have to try to make things clear before the exam on Thursday. So that's all I had for you. Does anyone have any questions before we uh, close up shop for today? All right. Well, thank you very much. And I hope you have a great long weekend. Enjoy your 4th of July. And I will see you all on Monday.